What we need to understand is that there is a way to work systemically that empowers the individual and the larger collective, but it requires uh, healthcare professionals to do something that's very counterintuitive for them, which is to put themselves first. Welcome to Safe Space Made Simple, a practical podcast that guides clinical leaders and healthcare managers to create trust and support with their teams. I'm your host, Trace Hobson. Join me for weekly interviews, practical tools, and inspiring transformational stories of bringing people together in healthcare. Now, let's dive in. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Safe Space Made Simple. I'm not going to lie. This this last couple of weeks has been really difficult. As many of you know, I work in healthcare and I work with um, clinical leadership teams, leaders that are under a lot of pressure and, and dealing with stress and distress in healthcare systems. Uh, I was actually given the opportunity to step into the other side of of that by becoming a bit of a patient because I uh, went to the hospital last week and uh, had chest pains, was concerned about that, went to the ER and was immediately um, rushed into care because there was a concern that my, my heart was um, not working properly. <laughs> and so the long and the short of it is that um, I ended up with a diagnosis of pericarditis, which is uh, really not a nice diagnosis. It's it's not as serious as a heart attack, so I'm glad about that. But it really is a viral infection that um, has all kinds of symptoms connected to it. One of which are heart pain, um, feeling like you know something really heavy is sitting on your chest and that you can't breathe. Uh, and and now I'm on medication for that. But the reason I bring that up is because. I had a really unique opportunity to get a bird's eye view of what it's like for nurses, for emergency rooms and doctors imaging. I got an opportunity to see two different emergency rooms because I was rushed from one hospital to another hospital. And it was incredible to experience the kind of care that the human beings are giving in the healthcare system that I was a part that I was being treated by. Uh, under incredibly difficult circumstances, difficult because of staff shortages, difficult because of functional areas not working properly, um, difficult because there was all kinds of challenges. But right from the nurse that advocated for me throughout the whole thing, the ambulance attendants or the uh, paramedics that took me from one location to another, the doctors that cared for me, the other emergency department that cared for me, I was given incredible care under difficult circumstances. And it made me appreciate, obviously, uh, you know, because my health is pretty dear to me. It it felt like it made me appreciate them um, all the more. But it also helped me to understand, um, you know, I've, I've been a patient at different times in my life. And as I'm sure that you have as well. And the difference between you know, great care and human beings that take the time to develop relationship with you and um, advocate for you or or that not happening is such a contrast. It makes me so grateful for that. And it also um, makes me even have more compassion for those that are struggling in situations where they just don't have any more capacity and they don't have any more sort of energy to give and they're struggling to to really provide the kind of care that they want to provide so i'm on the mend even though i'm still going through some fatigue and fever and um, other symptoms like that uh, just a matter of time before i'll be free of this and so i'm very grateful for that as well I also want to bring up a future event as well that I'll be a part of, which is a panel put together by Dr. Judy Boychuk Dusher, who is the director of Nursing the Future, an organization that is committed to helping nurse graduates stay in practice to have what they need to feel psychologically safe in their practice. And so I'm part of a panel that's going to be talking about that very subject. What do we need to do to create individual psychological health and safety, um, team and leadership psychological health and safety, and systemic 
psychological health and safety. And especially as it relates to some of the huge challenges we've got with absenteeism, distress, moral distress, um, and, and cumulative stress that's going on at all levels in healthcare right now. And so this panel is going to be discussing this. It's an incredibly gifted group of people that are committed to seeing those things change and also wading into the really complex and complicated issues that we have to in order to look at what's going to change what what do we need to do practically and pragmatically so that things can actually change for for nurses that are new graduates coming onto the floor um, so that we can get rid of terms like nurses that eat their young this whole idea of this sort of um you know trend that new nurses have that apparently within the first couple of years of their practice, they're more likely than not to leave healthcare and leave their practice completely because of their experience with other nurses that have been around longer, but also with a system that that doesn't provide the kind of supports that are needed for everybody. And so we're going to be talking about this in a future panel series. It'll happen in April and probably May. And so look forward to that. And I'll be making more announcements about that as well. But this got me to thinking about, so when we look at the massive problems in healthcare right now, the first thing I need to share is that I don't have the answers to, <laughs> to the problems in healthcare, so to speak. And I don't think anybody really does, but we need to still talk about what it is that what we're experiencing in healthcare is telling us instead of these things being a problem to solve what if they're a message to listen to and so as we look at this uh it, it's helpful for me to break this down into three categories first of all um what can i do as an individual uh, what can I do as a leader? And then what what can be done systemically? And I think that there's actually a nexus point or sort of a integration point between those three places that empowers the individual and serves the collective at the same time. And so in order to understand this, though, we've got to understand the big gaps that exist right now in healthcare. And one of the things that I notice in any healthcare setting, whether you're talking about um, Holland, or you're talking about Canada or the US, there is this massive disconnection that's going on between leadership and staff and clinical leadership and staff. And it's it's an unintended byproduct of what happens when we have really hierarchical and command and control environments. And I'm not saying that those environments are wrong or that that style of leadership is wrong. I think that there are times when we need command and control, we need hier hierarchy to, to manage in emergency situations, to manage in times when, um, you know, there's chaos. And so what we need to understand though, is that when it comes to developing the kind of what I call relational equity that's needed in order to navigate the complex problems that all of our, our healthcare stakeholders are dealing with, um, command and control and hierarchical leadership doesn't work. Uh, it is too simplistic and it doesn't take into account the, the need for human connection and co and self regulation that's necessary in high stress sectors. And so when we look at this, these big gaps exist. If you look at it from the perspective of um, a healthcare manager or even a director, you have a, a healthcare director that is in you know some sort of relationship with a healthcare manager. The healthcare manager is in a relationship with a group of clinical leaders that is in a relationship with the front line. And that that front line of of care and practice is where we really need to focus in order to understand what it is that that is needed all the way back to the director and even beyond to the ED level and to uh, the, the health authority level. But oftentimes that's not what happens. There isn't sort of a supportive relational approach taken to, um, to healthcare on the front line. Instead, if you talk to most people that are in healthcare practice, they feel very disconnected and unsupported, even isolated at times. And then when you talk to the clinical leaders, 
they feel exactly the same way. And then when you talk to the healthcare managers, they also feel the same way. And then if you talk to directors and they're they're really honest with you, they also feel the same way. They use different language, but everybody is feeling that sense of disconnection. So there's these big gaps that are going on in healthcare. And so what gets nurtured in those gaps or what, you know, one of the symptoms of those gaps are is is disrespect um dysregulation disconnection dysfunction distress and when you have that kind of thing going on for individuals and for teams and for whole sites inevitably that means that people are going to leave you know you can't as human beings no matter how committed and and believe me the people that have chosen healthcare as a career are highly committed to helping other human beings. And they, in so many cases, I I see and talk to people that have just muscled up for decades and then eventually hit a breaking point where they just can't do it anymore. And so they've got to start to take care of themselves. And so when you look at this, it's important to understand that this is not the way that we're meant to work. This is not the way that we're we're meant to um to navigate complexity. And so we got to actually look at developing something else because this turns into uh, systemic distress, PTSD. And even what Sandra Bloom uh, talks about as trauma organized systems. And so there's a perpetuation of the same thing happening over and over again, all of us expecting different results, but not getting those. And even the solutions that the system tries to bring to address these things end up becoming a part of the problem. And so we've got to look at doing something much different than that, because there is a better way. What we need to understand is that there is a way to work systemically that empowers the individual and the larger collective, but it requires uh, healthcare professionals to do something that's very counterintuitive for them, which is to put themselves first and to begin to understand how to prioritize their own care so that they can be there for other people. And so on a systemic level, that means really slowing down and listening to what it is that's going on in your body, what's what's going on in your gut and in your heart and and being witnessed in that in relationship so that you've got the kind of support and equity that you need to self-regulate, to co-regulate, to address this energy of distress, systemic trauma, PTSD, all of these things. Um, because if we don't do that, then nothing's going to change. And so one of the the models that I use for this is called the four A's. And it's, it's really the start of doing that systemic work within yourself that has a natural impact and integration point with larger systems, like, like your team's system or your family system, and even departmental systems is to begin with acknowledgement. You need to understand that that when we slow down to the speed of our presence and we start to notice and acknowledge and recognize the truth of what's going on inside of us, we take a deep breath and slow down. We are literally in the most practical way possible, putting ourselves at the top of our to-do list and taking care of ourselves. And it's not about fixing the problem so much as it's about acknowledging what's going on inside. And so as you acknowledge what's going on inside, then you can move into this place of appreciation. We all have a way of dealing with stress, distress, and unaddressed trauma uh, that is pervasive for all of us. Human beings all go through this. And so we all have a way of dealing with that that served us to get us to where we are. And some people they they deal with that by being incredibly reactive and they they um become angry. That was that was kind of one of the go-to places for me when I had a great deal of unaddressed trauma and anxiety that was going on for me. I would become reactive as a leader, as a manager. And what I didn't realize then was that that was my way of coping. And even though there were negative consequences connected to that, there were ways that actually that that served me, that it helped me to survive. So that's that reactive place. 
Then there's the other stance of resistance where you just become resistant to everybody and everything that is not aligning with what you want. And so that's a little bit more subtle, but it's also a form of survival, of, of coping with what's going on there. And resistance is like the knee-jerk reaction of saying no when a question comes to you without even actually thinking about the, the real question and the answer to it. It's it's thinking about um, nothing else other than just sort of being uh, in a more politically correct way reactive, but just generally resistant, resistant to other people's ideas, resistant to the possibilities, resistant to solutions, being kind of stuck in complaint and um you know, criticism and 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 condemnation, even if that's going on internally and you're not showing that to the world, that's still going on. And so that's resistance. Then another stance is reclusiveness. And this is the idea of sort of hiding uh, and, and becoming reclusive and just disappearing and disappearing relationally, emotionally, and just trying to get by and get through so that you can get to the end of your shift and go home and be done with it. Because that's what you really need to do. You just need to just, you know, not give that stuff any energy, go home and just be in your life. You know, that would be great if that's the way that that worked. But so often what ends up happening is you go to, to sort of recluse or to hide from what's going on and just ignore it. And then you end up noticing at the end of the day, when you go home, that that's pretty sticky. There's stuff that goes home with you and it rents space in your mind emotionally. And it, and it, you kind of keep it on board with you. And so that, that even though that reclusiveness is a way of coping, it doesn't actually serve long-term. So, so these are all things that go on for people that when you appreciate the way that you use different tactics, like I just described, or maybe there are other ones that you can think of that on the surface, you might go, yeah, that's probably not a positive thing, but um, definitely it's served me to get to me to where I am. It's helped me to get to right here, right now to survive to this moment in my life. And so it has, can you just take a moment and appreciate that? Virginia Satir used to, talk about how when we appreciate all the parts of ourselves, we can accept those different parts in a different way. And the appreciation gives us access to transformative power, systemically transformative power. Again, starting with us. Don't worry about everybody else so far. I mean, just with us. So that's that's the second A, which is appreciation. And then that moves into acceptance. You know, is it possible for you to let go of your resistance and to let go of your reaction and to let go of your reclusiveness and just accept for even a second in time that this is the way it is and that there's nothing that you can do in this moment except let go of it being different in any other way. Now that's not, that might sound a little bit strange and it also might sound like an abdication of responsibility. It's not. It actually is asking you to take even more responsibility and to enter into this paradox where when you surrender and you take in acceptance, you're actually at your strongest and you're poised for transformation. But you can't get there way if you keep resisting and 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 reacting and hiding from what it is that's there. The only way that you can begin to change what's there in meaningful ways for yourself is through acceptance. And so that's the third A. Then we get into the fourth A, which is allowing. If you can practice acknowledgement, appreciation, and acceptance in a meaningful way, it gives you access to a space that's now empty that allows for something new. And then this is where I use three coaching questions, systemic coaching questions that originally come from my uh, colleague, Alan Seal, the director of the Center for Transformational Presence. But now that I've used and adapted in my work in different ways, and the first question is, when you're in that allowing space, what is it that wants to happen? What wants to happen in the highest and best good? Number two is, who is that asking me to be? In other words, who is that asking me to show up as? What's the role that's asking me to play? And then number three is, what's that asking me to do in one step? 
The reason why these are systemic questions is because we're tapping into a higher frequency of information. If you go into the forest and you walk into the forest and you listen to the life that's there, the trees, the birds, the insects, the water, the mountains, all that's inside of that natural system, you'll begin to see and and notice that there's an underlying power that is empowering life and expansion and contraction and expansion again. And so when I think about healthcare systems and what kind of systems, you know, are really longing to come to the forefront, to me, it's this idea of natural systems, but how do we actually access that? Well, we have to begin to work in our own neurobiological reality And we have to understand that there is a higher frequency of information that we can tap into when we begin to address the systemic information within us. And I'm talking about some of the, some of the, what feels like difficult information at times, cumulative stress, distress, dysregulation, and all of the consequences of those things that we carry with us in our lives. When we slow down to the speed of our presence and we acknowledge and appreciate and accept, we can begin to understand and allow ourselves to listen and interpret and translate the energy or the systemic information that's there. In the programs that I create, there's three fundamental principles that we talk about all the time. The first one is presence. Being present with what's going on is so much more than just being present with something. It's It's actually doing the opposite of what helped us to survive, which is to let go of the fragmentation. You know, at some point, all of us have to survive moments in time where we decide to fragment that off and to compartmentalize that within ourselves. And so when we experience the emotions that want to come up at different times in a safe space, What's really happening there, there's a coalescing of that energy that was fragmented off to come back to the whole. And so as we listen to the systemic messages that feel like suffering a lot of the time or that feel incredibly difficult or heavy, what we are really listening to is information and energy that wants to become whole again. And as we use presence, we begin to notice that it's the counter counterintuitive or the 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 polarity of what we originally did which was to fragment off something in time we now come to be present and then we practice presence in order to allow our own system to address and process what it is that was fragmented off and so that's presence the second fundamental principle is the idea of listening And I'm talking about listening at a much deeper level than just with your ears. I'm talking about listening with your whole body and also listening to the conversation that has no words. It's the conversation in our lives and in our work that repeatedly comes up. It's an energetic, it's an emotional conversation, and it invites us into an engagement and a conversation within ourselves that is much deeper than the surface of life. And so when we listen on that level, we can begin to hear beneath the suffering and beneath the pain to access the transformative power that lies there. And so that's the second principle, which is listening. And then the third principle is systemic dialogues. It's understanding that our systems, starting with us and our own neurobiology, are actually trying to talk to us. And when we listen to them and when we are present with them, we enter into an inquiry, a dialogue that will help us to move in a new and a different direction. And so these three coaching questions that I shared with you that originally come from the Center for Transformational Presence and Alan Seal's work, one, what wants to happen? Two, who is that asking me to be? And three, what is that asking me to do? Those questions tap into that systemic information in a way that is um, almost feels sacred, if if I'm really honest, because you're listening to something that's so much deeper than the surface. 
And it's a systemic longing that wants to happen. It's a systemic longing who is developing me to be the best that I can be, you to be the best that you can be. And it's a systemic longing that's asking us to take new actions that have a new result. When we work in this way, this is the individual input that we can use that automatically integrates with higher systems, with collective systems, with team systems, with departmental systems. When we show up like this, there is a natural tipping point that happens with teams and with organizations where we can begin to see something new happen. Well, what are we actually talking about that's new? Well, we're talking about instead of command and control hierarchical approaches to leadership and to trying to fill those gaps that I described earlier with punitive processes and performance management that don't work, we now look at relational equity being the invitation of the systems that is the opposite of disconnection. We can't actually do this alone. And nobody in our healthcare system that feels like they're alone is able to access the fullness of who they are and show up in a way that is um, going to serve them and the people around them. And so one simple thing that we can do be, as, as advocates in the healthcare system is to learn how to develop conscious relationships with each other that carve out time and space that prioritizes relationship over tasks that understands that until we actually learn how to put the oxygen mask on ourselves, just like on a, on a flight, we can't help anybody else. And it's ridiculous to think that we can in healthcare care for other people without caring for ourselves or having systems in place that care for each other. And so as we look at this, presence, listening, and systemic dialogues, when we enter into that, it generates what I call a safe space. And that safe space is made up of psychological safety. It's made up of neurobiological safety. And it's also made up of presence-based leadership management and coaching. Presence-based because we choose to understand and actually practically apply the idea that we need to be with each other in order to work together. We need to actually know each other and support each other. And I've seen this happen on teams where we've worked to move from command and control to this relational, this relationally based leadership approach. And what ends up happening is exponential results. Every single time when I talk to a leader or a manager who goes through this process, they end up discovering that they're getting everything that they always longed for as that command and control leader before, but they're getting it in a way that nourishes their human spirit and also nourishes the human spirits of everybody on their team. Now, I'm not going to lie. It takes time. And it also takes what feels like a lot of effort at first, but like anything worthwhile, when you put that effort in, it starts to pay off exponentially. And so the, the challenge we have now as individuals, as leaders, and as a system is to understand what is it that is wanting to happen for me? What is it that um, that's asking me to do? Who is that asking me to be? And then who can I find in the system that will, you know, slow down with me and take some time with me. And I understand that this feels, you know, this can feel really difficult, especially if you're talking about um, emergency care or you're talking about, um, you know, an ICU team, or you're talking about, uh, you know, situations that, that it seems like operationally, we just don't have time for this. But the truth is we don't have time not to do this now. You know, we're in a situation in healthcare that if we don't change the way that we're working, we're not going to have a healthcare system, not for my parents, not for me, for my grandchildren. And so my invitation to you is to look at this and go, okay, what can I do as an individual and how might I develop the relationship I need with my boss or with my colleague or with the other leaders on my clinical, clinical leadership team? What might I do? 
to shift what's going on inside of me and actually take care of myself in a way that puts myself at the top of my to-do list. I know these are, you know, probably challenging questions, but I believe that it's possible to lead in a new way. And I've witnessed it myself in the teams that I've worked with, in the leaders that I've worked with, and also in the systems that I've worked with. I hope this was helpful for you. And I trust that you got something out of this. And if you did, please share this with others and also just reply to me on LinkedIn and reach out to me there to share what you learned. I would love to hear from you. So I look forward to meeting with you in person. Thank you so much for being here and listening to the podcast and supporting it. It's a joy for me to be able to create it. And I'm I'm glad that it is serving you. So thank you for being here. Remember, as you go away from here into the busyness of your work, of your life, remember to be a safe space. Thanks. See you next time. Thank you again for getting to the end of this podcast. And if you enjoyed this and you found that there was value in it for you, my invitation is for you to subscribe for future episodes that come out weekly on Tuesdays. Thank you again. And I'm looking forward to being with you next time. Now remember to be a safe space.